I was up at like two in the morning and whew, I was trying to go back to sleep, but how my, my mind was just running, not out of a state of, well, I shouldn't say that. I was going to say not out of a state of worry. I think when my wheels spin so much as an entrepreneur, because of all the different things that I have going on and you guys are the same, um, which is why we hang out. So we're in cahoots. It's why we're buddies, um, is this knowing that there's an element of concern. There's an element of focus. I always have to like recenter, 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 like fixing my eyes on Jesus, right? Fixing my eyes on Jesus, focusing on him instead of the concern. But simultaneous to that, there is work that has to be done. All right. Let's just start there. There is work that has to be done. This morning I was in Samuel again and, uh, Going through that, it's this time frame where Samuel has anointed Saul as king, okay? And basically, the only reason that this happened, this was before Israel at this point had never had a king. Lord is king. And they basically were like, we can't, we can't work like this anymore. We can't have you so far away. We need this, this person. We need this tangibility. All these other people have false idols. We need, we need a king, And God is like, that's not my heart for you. That's not my intention for you. Someone, let it be someone that I anoint instead of you falsely creating it. So at least they pleaded with God for God to send someone. Good good methodology for all of us to ask God for the thing instead of positioning the thing in our own flesh and desire and will. Make sure it's in his will and be patient associated to said ask. And we're going to talk about that today. Patience connected to the manna and what the bread of life actually is and who the bread of life actually is versus how it's being presented to us on a daily basis. And so speaking to work and speaking to the fact that there are things that we get to do. You know, you hear people say, I have to go to work, right? I get to go to work. Everything is perspective shift. After Saul was anointed king, Okay, he had already been anointed king. I love one of the first experiences of when the people needed him. It says this. It says they were talking about messengers and a city that was in the zone, the territory that was under going to be under attack and essentially being brought into slavery underneath the Ammonites. And their king was going to gouge out every right eye of that particular community, which he had already done with thousands of others. And they said, whoa, 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 before you gouge out our eyes and make us slaves, let us send out an opportunity uh, for other people to come and potentially help us before this happens. They sent out messengers, give us seven days to send messengers throughout Israel. So we're going to come back to that part. But what I want to say is what happened next when Saul was in in ready, it was time for him to be readied to be a king. It says when the messengers came to where Saul was and told the people about the plight, everyone broke into tears. Saul was there, but he wasn't receiving this information. Saul had been plowing a field with his oxen. And when he returned to town, he asked, what's the matter? Why is everyone crying? So they told him about the message and all the other things. Okay. The king was plowing a field. Come on, somebody. Maybe you're the CEO. Maybe you're the lead pastor. Maybe you're the ministry leader. Maybe you're the spouse, the mom, whatever your role, you have ordained work to do that actually keeps you on track and in alignment with where Christ has you. You know, when you're alone plowing some field that Christ is talking to you, you know, when you're working out next to the ocean, getting your run on, whatever that is, getting your pedal on. This is a time that the Lord can shape you and sharpen you. You can come back into center. Even when Jesus was removed from the people, removed from his disciples, and you might think that he was just like, ah, taking a nap. No, he was fasting. He was preparing. He was on his knees. He was praying. He was seeking God's wisdom. That's connected to work. 
There are works, good works, that have been predestined for you before you existed. And here we are complaining. We complain about our works. We complain about, oh, I gotta go today. Same old, same old. What if that's not the case? What if you repositioned your heart posture towards the things that you do on a consistent basis, even the things that feel like work, and taking them as a sign and an opportunity to become? So that when you go back into said scenarios where people are weeping and crying, you have fresh perspective, right? This is what Saul was able to do. And right from that place, it says that the Holy Spirit descended on him. And when he descended on him, it actually brought him to a place of anger. So we can talk about this. Okay. Does anger evoke negativity in your mind because of hostility, maybe out of a place of fear or judgment, maybe out of a place of abuse. I totally understand that all of those things could be possible. And yet at the same time, it's this knowing in the space and the character of Christ, there was many times that he became angry, but anger is also what evokes someone to change. Anger is also what evokes someone to uh, create a barricade so that people can't get in to said abuse situation anymore. I think about sex trafficking, right? Mm, That infuriates me. Think about homelessness. I think about the poverty mentality that's been put on the church in so many ways. So many ways. And it makes me so mad because it's inhibiting us. When the enemy gets his hands on anything, I get pissed. I'm so mad. And so I wonder for you, have you put anger to the side because you think it's not godly? Because there's elements of anger that are so aligned to the Lord when it's for him, by him, through him, that we're activated to pursue. So Saul in this moment obviously was pursuing, saving his brothers and sisters, saving the chosen people of Israel and going against this particular other king and kills them and does all that. Old Testament has a lot of slaying happening. Here we are now with the slaying of the spirit happening towards the enemy, right? I had this awesome guy, Austin Blanchville. I think I talked about him on Tuesday too, on my podcast on Monday. And uh, he said that his dad, when he was little, and when he was on the pitcher's mound doing baseball, that was like his, his sport, uh, he would tell him, he would actually wrote ATDS on his, on his hand one day, ATDS. And he's like, dad, what's that? He's like, when you're on that pitcher's mound, I just re- want you to remember your name. Ooh, this is a good father. I just want you to remember your name. God wants you to remember your name. Remember that you are called and anointed and mighty. ATDS stands for Austin the Demon Slayer. And so he said, I want you to just take that ball. I want you to rip him a new one. I want you to know that like your throw is just coming after the demon and slay it. And I'm like, come on, Lord, how prophetic. Because it's literally what his son now does outside of baseball. But in the marketplace, in social media world, 